what else do I want to talk about? For the intro? Yeah. I don't know. We we started talking about the election of all things. You want to talk about the election again? Sure, why not? (laughs) All right. So, what were you, when you started looking into the election? Yeah. Like, what were you doing? Well, I was actually having, I was having to work while, working while doing it. So I had a, had a little uh, internet browser up on, with the uh, Google US election results. Yeah. And just had that watching along in a couple tabs. Yeah. It's not like cricket. (laughs) Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. For quite a number of months now, I've treated the US election as a bit of a comedy show, really. Yeah. It's two old guys standing on the stage trying to whack, uh, punch each other, uh, knock each other in the head, pretty much. Yeah. It's kind of a bit ridiculous. It's a bit, a bit sad, actually, seeing as I'm half American as well. Yeah. But, uh, (laughs) this was a bit of, this was a bit of a comedy show. The problem that we've come to the end of it is that it's a dead tie. Half the country wants Trump, half the country wants Biden. Oh, it's what, 268 versus 213 or something like that. Something like that. But those numbers will shift dramatically if the states start shifting around. Yeah. If the electoral college votes start moving, because they're not just one, two, three, four, five votes. It's 10 votes. It's 20 votes. Yeah. So those numbers can shift dramatically back and forth. But Mm -hmm. um, where it sits at the moment, as as of when we're recording, it's uh, right now... Trump needs to win all five contested states to get over the line. Yeah. Biden needs one of them. Close call. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know who, I, I do not know who is going to win this one, but yeah. it's going to be interesting whoever does win because I really do pity whoever gets the job because they have to somehow bring a very, a much more deeply divided country together than it was before, mm. where... Yes, America was at each other's. Americans were at each other's throats over politics, which is stupid to begin with. Mm-hmm. There are much more important things that you could be fighting and battling over, but we're choosing politics. Fine. The problem. The problem is that now the numbers are in, and fifty percent, almost fifty percent of Americans. I think it's maybe forty-eight percent, if I'm being exact. Forty-eight percent want Trump. Fifty-one percent want Biden. Yeah. So that's a. That's a bit of a mountain to climb, whoever gets the job. Oh, I don't know if Biden will, will actually cope for like, the first year. I don't think he'll, he'll last. He'll no. be President Harris. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> he'll be the police, uh, was it the police person? The police lady? Yeah, she was the district... Prosecutor. Uh, d- district. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, com- district completely attorney. corrupt to the mm-hmm. core. Why did he have to pick her of all people? I mean, on the debate stage, she, she went up, she targeted him and went after him and went... You're a racist. You you stopped me from going to school. What? Yeah, on the debate stage. Okay, I didn't listen to the debate. Oh, I was, again, la- watching it for comedy, but right. yeah. I don't know if debates are comedy. <laughs> These ones were. Oh, yeah? Okay. <laughs> it, it was a stage of, fif- I, thought the, I thought four years ago, it was the Republican debate where you had 15 uh, grown-ass adults yelling at each other for an hour. I thought that was uh, bad. Uh this time around, it's going. Oh, this is supposed, this is actually a comedy show. Never mind. Yeah, I like the one when uh, twenty sixteen when Clint Eastwood is debating a chair. Oh, because the opponent good. didn't rock up. That was good. Yeah. Well, the guy who was debating was Obama. Was he? Yeah, he was okay. talking to Obama. All right. Again, Obama being empty chair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a bit of a. It, it was it was a bit of, bit of fun. Bit was of it twenty sixteen? I think it was. Yeah, yeah, it was maybe, maybe it was twenty fifteen. Not sure. Like the year before the. All right. Yeah, I was like, what the? Okay. Yeah, but um, no, uh, I, was, I watched I watched the Democratic debates just to see how how far far left they would try and spin. And um, Biden is a moderate, yeah. I think, but he entertains people on the far left. And yeah. Kamala Harris is far left. Yeah, like Bernie Sanders, far left. And so the question is, like, does Biden have the courage to you know veto stuff that gets through I from his party? I don't think he has the. I don't think he has the will anymore. I think he, I think that he is Quarter too old, capacity. too tired. He's he yeah. He's run out of he's run out of RAM. <laughs> I was like, I saw the bit where he introduces his granddaughter and he goes, "This is my son, Bo Biden." Oh gosh, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and honestly, I feel sorry for the guy. Like, like really, regardless of we might he and I might differ on politics. I do feel sorry for him because he is what seventy six, seventy eight. Yeah. And he's been put up on this platform by his party. His party's done this to him. The left has done this to him and said, you are our candidate because you are the only one who will be able to convince enough people to vote against Trump. Mm. 
And he's going, yeah, I want to be president. I'm 78 years old, but I want to be president. No, that's when you should retire. You I know. know. Retired by then. Oh, I, I've been amazed. I've looked when a, a few different politicians have popped up oh, on the left and the right. I've looked up their ages and gone, you're 76. You're 80. What are you doing still still in office? You should be golfing or something like that. I don't well, know. they should be voted out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, my personal opinion is term limits, to be totally honest. Yeah. Like, put term limits in so you can have... You can be elected four times, right? So that's 12 years maximum. Well, but it did. Like, with um, after FDR went, like, for three terms... Oh, sorry. Not for the presidency. For senators and House of Reps. Oh, okay. Yeah. Term limits for them to stop them from being career politicians. Give them, give them a max... I'll be generous, give them a max 12 years, right? Yeah. So what is it? If that's, that's either th uh, three or three between, I can't remember if it, between House of Reps and Senate, if it's a three-year term or four-year term. Mm. But either way, you get three or four goes at it, essentially, consecutive goes. <laughs> I mean, that would, that would stop your, these career politicians from rotting the system, yeah. plain and simple. And you would get fresh people in to... Uh, I guess stop well, certainly stop political corruption from going on. Yeah, yeah. All right. Anyway, but anyway, that anyway, that's not, that's not, that's not going to solve all the problems. Yeah, but gonna... I can talk about U.S. politics all day long, and that's not what we're here to do today. So no, but it, it sort of leads into uh, um, into our intro. So yeah. Alright guys, welcome back to the Fire in the Desert with myself and Pat. How you going, Pat? <laughs> yeah, doing pretty good. Doing pretty good, Johnny. Alright, cool. So, you know, but we're sort of recording this after the election uh, results are in, but not fully declared. Yeah, true. And I, I was reading, I was doing some uh, preparation for this, because it's not elections, but it's about, you know, Greenpeace and how Greenpeace ranks the candidates. So I took a snapshot of this uh, website just to make sure, you know, it's still up there and uh, they don't take it down. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's uh, Greenpeace asked the 2020 candidates how they'll act on the climate crisis if they become president. Here's what they say, dot, 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 or didn't say. And, and so, you know, there's a bit about, uh, there's, there's the two candidates, so uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Mm. And he says, you know, click on the candidate to understand where where they are and where they uh, stand with the Green New Deal and fossil fuels. And then you as the, you know, the website browser can either click on praise them or shame them. So there's a thumbs up and thumbs, thumbs down. And you can, uh, I guess, you put it onto your own social media and share it with everyone. Yeah. That kind of stuff. And then you can change. I shame Donald Trump. Oh, <laughs> change the course of history, you know. With a click of a button, yeah. social media at its finest. So, so what you see there, you know, yeah, the picture uh, with Joe Biden, uh, Green New Deal, thirty nine point five out of fifty. I don't really know how they score this, but I guess you that's know, some sort of scoring metric. Some kind of scoring metric there, and and then how he sits on not, uh, no fossil fuels, thirty six out of fifty. So therefore, he scores seventy five point five out of hundred. Mm -hmm. That's like what? Is that a ding distinction? Isn't it? it just yeah. Costs, okay. Yeah. Okay. Just arbitrary numbers, all right. And, and then, like you know, you see the big blue, you know, praise button and the shame, yeah. shame button, and it talks about you know how you know Joe Biden his. Uh, I'll read it out. So Biden's climate plans show how far the baseline for political action to advance environmental justice and tackle the climate change crisis has shifted. But more transformative action is still needed to fully address the scale of the interlocking crisis of climate catastrophe, racial injustice, and the global pandemic. Okay, <laughs> so to join all three of those issues. Just lump in, sum, in, in, Okay, um, You are the savior of mankind. Yeah. Biden has committed to net zero greenhouse and gas emissions by 2050 and a carbon pollution-free electric power by 2035. Although his plan doubled down on the risky carbon capture and sequestration technology, he pledges to eliminate coal, gas, and oil subsidies and hold polluters accountable, but has not pledged to reject permits for the new fossil fuel infrastructure. He made strong commitments to coal and power plant workers, but has not promised to guarantee wages and benefits to all workers impacted by the energy transition. 
Biden wants to re-establish U.S. global leadership to tackle the climate crisis, but more pressure is needed to ensure Biden administration w- would confront the fossil fuel companies fueling the crisis. So, just to make clear on that, mm-hmm. in 15 years, we're going to transition to carbon pollution free electric power yep that's what it says there yeah yeah i mean well, obviously that they've got that from biden's campaign i would suspect but that's their do you think they're going to do that in 15 years <laughs> what is it um fusion is always 40 years away and that's what they say about fusion technology <laughs> because we can't we can't handle fission so we had to go to fusion uh I'm but, sorry. But I, I like how it's sort of like interlock. So inter, you know, was it uh, intersectionality? That kind of idea. Yeah, yeah. Let's lump in climate catastrophe, racial injust, injustice, and global pandemic, which I'm assuming is COVID, right? I would just, I would assume you're right. So yeah. let's join them all into this into super, one big, <laughs> one big <problem>. complex ball <laughs> and go, Biden, can you please fix this? And let's give you a score as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, so that's Biden's ranking. All right, so number two is Donald Trump. How did he score? All right, Green New Deal, zero. No no to fossil fuels, so his position, zero. So therefore, he's big, he scores a big zero out of 100. <laughs> this is Chris's Greenpeace on this. Um, and how did he score? Trump denies the reality of the climate crisis and is actively promoting fossil fuels while weakening existing climate protections. His cabinet is fill, filled with former coal and oil lobbyists. Trump gets an F for putting out our most vulnerable communities and our futures and our very futures at risk. And that's, that's it. That, you know, three lines compared to Joe what? Biden. Well, that sounds really bad. We shouldn't vote for this guy. Well, apparently he can click praise or shame. Apparently. Yeah, I noticed that. Like, I'm surprised they even gave him gave you the option to praise him for that. <laughs> <Praise>. <laughs> Like, that, that, honestly, that would be a hilarious level of ridiculous media or media bias if the only option you had was to shame Trump and yeah. praise Biden. That would be hilarious. But in all fairness, they haven't done that. So that's kind of thumbs up for for um, at least some level of honesty. So, so what do you think when you, integrity. See, when you see a website like this? Or yeah, what do you think? Oh, I think it's a bit. I think it's a bit bit a bit funny. I wouldn't. The fact that they've thrown magic numbers at Biden to give him this figurative 75.5%. It's like, how did you get that number? It me- it's, it's absolutely meaningless. From, from dead voters. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, it indeed. I don't know. Oh, dear. For the listeners in the future, you might find out. <laughs> um, yeah, don't, don't, you, don't, you don't want to date this podcast. <laughs> no. Anyway, so but, yeah, but so, it's like one dimension to look at your candidates. Oh right? yeah, absolutely. purely on fossil fuels. Oh yeah, and well, the well, climate even crisis. In, even for the recent recent uh, Queensland election, a few of the candidates that we had in our local electorate were single issue politicians. Like you look at their campaign, and they're I am for education. There was even an anti vaxxer I hate five G. I hate vaccinations. There was another, there was another really? one. I didn't oh, see that. Oh yeah, <laughs> the, it was it was something. Uh, anyway single issue they're going i want to get into i want to get into parliament and this is what i want to fight for yeah cool so in the first year you do that you get whatever you you get whatever you want through Hmm. what do you do for the next three years i don't know that's the problem with that's the problem with looking at a politician any politician or party and going and looking at through a single a single issue lens yeah it's no no you need someone who can go in and do a b like do a but they also need to do B, C, D, E, F, G as well. Yeah. So, yeah. There's, so there's green, green, green like pieces, green, this came from Greenpeace, didn't it? it? Well, yeah. Green yeah, piece. Greenpeace. Uh, it shows a very, bit of an ignorant view of the world. If your focus is in, you can have a focus on the environment. Say, the environment is important. But if you focus everything you see through that lens, you are blinded to everything outside that peripheral vision. Yeah, and then you end up with this praise and shame kind of thing because oh, yeah. that's the only thing that you hold sacred. Yeah. So I'm going to go into Patrick Moore. And mm. He wrote a book called Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout. Yeah. And he grew up in Canada. His father owned a forestry business. He had a PhD in ecology. And he was one of the founders of Greenpeace. They were one of the guys who... Well, first started this sort of environmental activism. So mm. he started protesting against the nuclear bomb testing yeah. in the in the oceans of America. 
I'll read a bit from his book. So after the signing the treaty, the U.S. focused on underground testing of atomic bombs in the Nevada desert, where there was a long-range test range. Even their relatively small tests shook the buildings in Las Vegas. It was simply not possible to test hydrogen bombs there. They would break windows in the casinos. Prior to the treaty, the U.S. had tested its hydrogen bombs on Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific, exposing islanders to large doses of radioactivity. If the American government didn't want to continue testing thermonuclear weapons, it had to find somewhere outside the lower 48 states to do so. It didn't take long for the Atomic Energy Agency to identify Amchika Island, halfway out the far-flung Aleutians, as the perfect place to play with the ultimate weapon. It was well removed from New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and any other likely source of complaint. In the era of superpower dominance, it didn't seem to matter that Amchika was closer to Japan, Russia, Korea, and China, and Canada than it was to the US, with the exception of sparsely populated Alaska. This turned out to be a bit of an oversight on America's part. Project Kanakin would be the largest underground nuclear test the US had carried out. Scheduled for October 6, 1971, the 5 megaton device was designed to proof test a warhead for the Spartan anti ballistic missile program. And then he goes on about uh, how they set sail. So on September 15th, 1971, we set off from Vancouver to confront the H bomb. 11 activists plus Captain J.C. Cormack, it was an epic voyage with terrible storms and serious mechanical breakdowns. We made headway, taking a straight course from the north shore of the Queen Charlotte Islands across the North Pacific to the first islands in the Aleutian chain. About three days after leaving the site of the land, a U.S. reconnaissance aircraft buzzed us. Clearly we had the attention of the authorities, no doubt the CIA, the Coast Guard, the Atomic Energy Commission, and even the White House was tracking our progress. Then we received troubling news. The Atomic Energy Commission had decided to delay the test one month. The new date was November 6. October 6 was late enough in the season, but the new schedule pushed us well into the severe winter weather. Suddenly nature became a serious factor in our ability to reach a test site. At the time we believed the delay was an effort to make our mission impossible. We later learned that technical problems in the underground cavity where the bomb would be placed caused a delay. So even though we were blocked from sailing to the nuclear test site, and even though that 5 megaton explosion did take place on November 6, 1971, we were the ultimate victors. Fueled by action and the resulting publicity, tens of thousands of protesters blocked border crossings between the US and Canada the day the bomb was detonated. The public opposition to the tests forced President Nixon to cancel the remaining H-bomb tests in the planned series in February 1972. This was at the height of the Cold War and the height of the Vietnam War. So, you know, eco-activism, it works. Yeah. It convinces the public and the public joined in and uh, convinced the president to uh, cancel the remaining H-bomb tests. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a bit, you know... Detonating bombs in the Pacific Ocean was a bit sus. And, you know, Australia also had a few by the French. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. Well, I guess it was a classic case of, it sounded like a good idea at the time. Mm. Obviously yeah. not so much. So, you know, the Greenpeace guys that went out there, I believe would be November as well, because I think uh, we jumped over a bit. But on the way, they heard the news that, yeah, the Nixon had uh, cancelled the tests. Mm. And, and this is one of the things that I picked up. So after successful protests of nuclear testing in 1972, there was a remark by his friend. And so even though we had been on the opposite sides of the debate about whether to go home or go on, Bob Hunter was to become the kind of lifelong friend that rarely comes along. He was a prominent editorial columnist with the Vancouver Sun and our city main newspaper, and he had established himself as an exciting commentator on the emerging environmental movement. As we make our way back down the coast of Alaska, Bob and I had time for sustained reflection. But there was one conversation that still seems as if it happened yesterday. So he says, uh, Pat, this is the beginning of something really important and very powerful, he predicted. But there's a very good chance it will become a kind of eco-fascism. Not everyone can get a PhD in ecology. So the only way to change the behavior of the masses is to create a popular mythology, a religion of the environment where people simply have faith in the gurus. And today I shudder at the accuracy of his foresight. So mm. uh, yeah, that pit rings true. You know, he's the only guy in that group, in that boat, who has a PhD in ecology. Right. None of them have. 
and you know later on he would try to change his mind about certain things because he takes things from a scientific and factual perspective yep. but his colleagues and friends don't don't want to do yeah. that yeah there is an addiction that comes with amassing power you can see that even at the early stages that this group by their action success gained, as well then their success gained influence yeah. gained public awareness once that starts it's a very difficult thing to walk away from to let go that drive to get more power more influence kind of grows or maybe they're sort of addicted to their success and they're trying to find ways to continue that mm. and they're trying to find problems in everything that yeah might not be problematic mm. Right, because we'll, we'll go on later on, and uh, you know some of the stuff that they did do, which was some good ideas, was I said they protest against Soviet whaling and Japanese whaling. Yeah, they protest against baby seal harvesting. So I guess guys in, in Canada, was it Canada, Alaska? I have to look it up. Anyway, mm. uh, but they're they're against you know seal harvesting, but baby seal harvesting. Yeah. They were against uh, nuclear waste dumping in the ocean, so that's pretty good. Again, it's like U.S. going, what do we do with all of this nukes? Uh, in the ocean it goes. Again, uh, I don't... sounds like a smart idea at the time. Yeah. All right, so one of his uh, sort of wake-up moments was when he attended this uh, Nairobi conference. Yeah. So I'll read it out. So in 1982, the United Nations held a conference in Nairobi to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the first UN Environment Conference in Stockholm, which I had also attended. I was one of 85 environmental leaders from around the world who was invited to craft a statement of our collective goals for environmental protection. It quickly became apparent there were two nearly opposite perspectives in the room. The anti-development perspective of environmentalists from wealthy industrialized countries and the pro-development perspective of the environmentalists from the poor developing countries. As one developed country activist put it, Taking a stand against development in his woefully poor country would get him laughed out of the room. It was hard to argue his position. A well-fed person has many problems. A hungry person has but one. The same is true for development, or lack of it. We could see the tragic reality of poverty on the outskirts of our Kenyan host city. Those of us from industrialized countries recognized that we had to be in favor of some kind of development, preferably the kind that didn't ruin the environment in the process. Thus, the concept of sustainable development was born. Now, this was when I re first realized there was another step beyond pure environmental activism. The real challenge was to figure out how to take the environmental values we had helped create and weave them into the social and economic fabric of our culture. This had to be done in ways that didn't undermine the economy and were socially acceptable. It was clearly a question of carefully balanced, not dogmatic adherence to a single principle. I knew immediately that putting sustainable development into practice would be much more difficult than the protest campaigns we mounted over the past decades. It would require consensus and cooperation rather than confrontation and demonization. Greenpeace had no trouble with confrontation, hell, we made it an art form, but we had difficulty cooperating and making compromises. So we were great at telling people what they should stop doing but almost useless at helping people figure out what they should be doing instead. It almost seemed like the right time for me to make a change. I felt a primary task raising mass public awareness of the imp importance of the environment had been largely accomplished. By the early 1980s, a majority of the public, at least in the Western democracies, agreed with us that the environment should be taken into account in all our activities. When most people agree with you, it is probably time to stop beating them over the head and sit down with them to seek solutions to our environmental problems. At the same time, I chose to become less militant and more diplomatic. My Greenpeace colleagues became more extreme and intolerant of dissenting opinions from within. In the early days, we debated complex issues openly and often. It was a wonderful group to engage with in wide-ranging environmental policy discussions. The intellectual energy in our, in our organization was infectious. We frequently disagreed about specific issues, yet our ultimate vision was largely shared. Importantly, we strove to be scientifically accurate. For years, this had been the topic of, of many of our internal debates. I was the only Greenpeace activist with a PhD in ecology. And because I wouldn't allow exaggeration be beyond reason, I quickly earned the name Dr. Truth. 
It wasn't always meant as a compliment. Despite my efforts, the movement abandoned science and logic somewhere in the mid-1980s just as society was adopting the most reasonable item in our environmental agenda. So I pause it there, mm. but it's like, hey, when you're from a rich country, then you can have many problems. You can afford to have many problems, yeah. right? Because you're not starving to death. Yeah, exactly. Whereas these guys from Nairobi were, were you know, they're developing, they are a developing country. They're yeah. not yet developed. And they're going, Energy, hey, we, food, yeah, we, we need those. We need to, we need to burn, well, we need to burn coal so that we can power and continue to, can continue our development to get up to where you guys are at yeah well well coal is the only cheapest form for us yeah, i mean we don't exactly we can't just have nuclear right away yeah we, we don't have we, we don't can't have, we can't just do it overnight yeah but you've got the problem that the in the wealthy countries their environmentalists were saying no no no, we have to protect the environment guys we can't go we can't go burning coal coal is bad and you've got the developing developing nations going yeah but we need it to be able to Build it, build our nation up to get to where you are right now. Yeah. Like even the playing field. So, and you reach a and you reach a loggerhead when you start arguing and debating over the over this issue and not realizing the bigger, the broader picture, and the heart and the heart of the issue is it's, it's that you're trying to improve the quality of human life yeah. across the board. Yeah. You know what? They, 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 they like the bit what he says. You know, you, you got to cooperate, and you try to understand what from different perspectives. Where mm. you know Greenpeace and, and in the previous decades they were mm. good at protesting, saying, "No, you can't do that. No, yeah. you can't do that. Don't we're, do this." Don't we're really we're, we're really good at telling telling people what they're not able to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's actually interesting. I was I was thinking about this passage as you were reading it and going, "There are so many parallels to what's happening with our modern with that today's political scene yeah and political culture and environments obviously this podcast this episode is not talking about the u.s election but there are so many parallels i'm seeing yeah between what we're talking about here in regards to this specific issue and in the broader context of left versus right conservative versus liberal mm. but but it's easy you know what we, we heard earlier was from the this um forecast by by Patrick Moore's friend was that it's easy to protest, it's easy to confront people oh, yeah. and to and to be negative and to stop people from doing stuff. It's yeah. harder to come up with the solutions and to, you know, come up go through the science field. It's harder to compromise. It's it's, it's harder to develop solutions. Um to get your PhD in ecology. Yeah. What's that? What, eight years? Yeah, now? exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's much hard it's much harder to sit down with your air quotes enemy or or even better word rival and and hash out a middle ground compromise where you don't get everything you want but mm -hmm. both of you get something of what you want yeah and that's that's hard that takes that takes work that takes effort i'll just quickly go through the other bit which was you know the cold war ends and then some of these oh this is what patrick moore says about neo-marxists and far left people will start going into the environmental movement yeah so there were even people in the Toronto office in 1985 who were wearing army fatigues and red berets in, st in support of the Sardinistas. So I'm assuming that's some kind of a South American sort of right. communist rebel group or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but what, what, what he says was uh, the transformational power of sustainable theory is that it turns a foot soldier fighting environmental wars into a diplomat looking for peaceful solutions. So this takeaway point from the Nairobi conference about, you know, sustainable theory. It steers one from a stance of confrontation, telling people that what they should stop doing, to trying to find consensus about what we should do instead. There is simply no escaping the fact that nearly 7 pe billion people wake up every morning on this, on this planet with real needs for food, energy, and materials. Sustainability is partly about continuing to provide for those needs maybe even providing more food and energy for people in developing countries, while at the same time reducing our negative environmental impact. Not all my colleagues at the meeting in Nairobi agreed with this approach. Mm -hmm. Many, especially those from the developed countries, reject the idea of sustainable development because it seemed too much of a compromise. It meant that they would have abandoned the good guy, bad guy approach to environmentalism and recognize that we were all in the same boat. It meant that they might become assimilated by the established order. Right, and and he walks away 
he says with a a change perspective he says that you know i've got to include these seven billion people into this environmental into the idea. equation yeah which is a good idea I mean, oh yeah and, and i like how he says you know it's it's not a good guy bad guy of course which not. is what his colleagues were who are disagreeing with this idea yeah. And saying, you know, you Nairobi people, you are compromising, you, you, you're hurting the environment, even yeah. though you need food. <laughs> well, we, well we've, we've spoken about this, I think, in one of, our, one of our first podcasts back in season one. We were talking about the media and how they were presenting their uh, ideological opponents. And they were saying, they were essentially framing it in language of going, this person is evil. This person is a fascist. This person is the enemy. You wouldn't want to be be with them, would you? Or, or how can you even develop or discuss or you know come up with a solution if someone's calling you names? Exactly, exactly. Well, I I can remember learning learning as a child, don't call names. Yeah. Like it doesn't get you anywhere. It's it's a child's tactic essentially, mm. and it's one you should that teachers and parents were teach were teaching me and obviously everyone everyone at that age to grow out of as a arguing tactic it's a debating tactic because it's something a child does you're not, not a child anymore you're growing up find find a better way to communicate your idea yeah um, unfortunately it's very easy yeah. and we've got a lot of people in the well in the public sphere who have resorted to name calling and made it entertaining mm. so yeah which so, hasn't i don't think it's been I, I don't think it's been very good no it's not so I'll give you some examples from the book about sustainable development. So it's about, you know, re reducing our footprint, you mm. know, our land usage. Can we become more efficient with our land use? And, and one of the areas he talks about is organic farming, which is, you know, let's let's try to make uh, everything natural. We'll mm. try not to use any synthesized um, fertilizer or anything like that. No. But what that does is just makes your footprint bigger because you get to use more of the land yep. to produce the crop. That's right. Rather than high efficient, you know, reducing the, your your land usage yeah. to produce the same amount of crops. Mm. Uh, when we're doing about forestry, you know, mm. we're we're not talking about deforestation because if you're replanting the f the, the trees after you chop them down, yeah, that's not deforestation. No. That, that's just sustainable development. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and again, I think that most, I think if you talk to most people, they go, yeah, if you chop a tree down, you should plant a new one instead. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, nothing, nothing, like, I can't imagine anyone going, that's a bad idea. Yeah. So, simple. Okay. Improving yield per land. So we also talk about the, the, the crops, but also animal farming. So preserving the wildlife. So instead of clearing mass lands, maybe mm. you can improve uh, your usage of land for animals. Yep. The other one was making energy cheaper for developing countries, so reducing the number of people they need and to work. So, um, this I, I guess this was about um, if you're going to transition from dirty energy to say clean energy. Yeah, that clean energy still needs to be affordable for people. Yeah, because otherwise you just end up paying a massive power. Exactly. Bill. What's the point? Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's, it's balancing the green initiatives with your economical initiatives and finding that happy balance between the two. Yeah. Not where your e your green or your eco initiatives outweigh or outbalance your economic and mm. vice versa. Economic don't, doesn't outweigh your eco and green initiatives. It's that middle ground. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the also the idea I think was um, that was mentioned I think when it's about reducing what people need was about making stuff efficient so rather yeah. than something which burns a lot of energy yeah make that device less energy intensive yeah 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 all right uh, there's so many stuff in that book I can talk about but we'll go to why he leaves Greenpeace unfortunately mm. so I'll read this section in fact, it wasn't until long until the paper campaign morphed into a much broader one. So they were campaigning about the, the, the paper industry. So a campaign for global ban on chlorine in all industrial processes, including polyvinyl chloride, PVC, or simply referred to as vinyl. Not the records. <laughs> <laughs> There's also, you know, I think water pipes and also... Yeah. Um, what do you call it? Electrical insulation. Right. You know, when looking at your phones. So this is when Greenpeace really lost me. As a student of advanced biochemistry, I realized chlorine was one of the 92 natural elements in a periodic table. 
and it is essential for life. You don't just go around banning <laughs> entire elements, especially when life without them would be impossible. This, would, this was the first time I really noticed that none of my fellow directors, including Chairman David McTarget, had any formal science education. This could variously be described as political and social activists, or as environmental entrepreneurs looking for a career in a now highly popular environmental movement. These were perfectly acceptable orientations, but we were now dealing with very complex issues of chemistry and biology. The great divide between the physical sciences and the social sciences was making things extremely difficult. I reminded my fellow directors that chlorine was one of the building blocks of the universe and questioned whether banning an element was within our jurisdiction. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's I ridiculous. He I, he I hereby ban oxygen. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's like oxygen you would, thief. <laughs> honestly, if I came up with that idea, people, everyone would laugh. Yeah. Because we need oxygen to breathe. Yeah. Same argument of you need chlorine to, as you said, to make all the stuff. It's a, it's a universal element. Yeah. You can't just go ahead and ban it. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is what he said. So I'll continue. Um, I reminded them that adding chlorine to drinking water represented the biggest advance in the history of public health and save hundreds of millions from death due to cholera, typhoid, and other waterborne communicable diseases. I explained that more than 75% of our pharmaceuticals, including antibiotics, were based on chlorine chemistry. And if that wasn't enough, I said, the best way to deliver the slightly chlorinated drinking water to the public is in a PVC pipe. The other Greenpeace directors behave as though there were minor exceptions to the general rule that chlorine should be banned worldwide. So I had to leave. Simple Science made me a Greenpeace dropout. There you go. It's a bit sad. Uh, that's why I feel. It's... Well, it's a bit, well, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a loss to what sounds like a an organization or a movement, a grassroots people driven movement that started off with really good intentions. Yeah. That grew in what I was talking before grew, grew in power and influence until that power and influence. I think to, to, went to the head of the organization, got to the head, got to their head and they went and they lost, lost their minds. Well, it's like, um, you know, we've got to find more problems to keep our organization alive. Yes. So that's what's the big thing. Yeah. Mm. Chlorine's poisonous. PVC is poisonous. If you burn it, I guess. So let's, let's ban chlorine. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, like, it's, a, in, it's a simplistic <sighs> argument to a complex question. So we go, we are producing too much fossil fuels. We are potentially increasing the Earth's temperature. Okay, that's the problem. What's the co what is a potential cause? Human activity, burning carbon. Yeah. What do we do? Ban carbon, car ban fossil fuels, ban coal. Yeah. Carbon dioxide is bad. I can remember in school being taught the idea that carbon dioxide going up, burn, um, going up into the atmosphere is a bad thing. I didn't can and, I, and then in science that was in social like social science class. Then in science class, I was learning about how trees will take in carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. Yeah. It didn't connect in my child's mind at the time. Carbon dioxide was the same thing. One class is telling me it's evil. The other one telling me it's kind of essential. Yeah. Well, well the trees take out the carbon from the air, right? Yep. Because the carbon dioxide. Yep. And then... And turn it into, and recycle it, turn it, well, turn it into oxygen. So well, we can well they, they, they take the carbon out and turn in, and, and it builds the, the trunks or the trees or yep. the branches. And that's, you know, carbon. Yep. And they can use it, burn it, use it as energy. Yep. Yep. And then recycle it. Yeah. Now, I can't, now there's a fair, now there's, a, again, the nuance of this, there's a fair argument that we can be producing too much carbon for the trees to cope with, but that's fine. But the argument today, the, and the, probably the thought that's in a lot of people's heads is that carbon dioxide is bad. Yeah. Carbon dioxide is a core, is another core building block. Mm. It's a, it's a bit of a ridiculous argument when you break it down yeah. and you actually examine it with a little bit of critical thinking. And I think this is what, this is what Patrick Moore is doing right here. He's yep. going to his co, his colleagues, his, uh, was it board members? His Greenpeace, was it directors? Directors, thank you. Yeah, yeah it wasn't a board. The, um, yeah. He went, he went to the directors and went, we're trying to ban a universal element called car. Well, in this case, in our, in our scenario, we're trying to ban carbon. You can't just go and ban carbon. It doesn't work. Yeah. You can't go and do that. Yes, we can. Carbon's evil. Carbon's bad. We're going to save the planet. Mm. 
it's the the parallel is uh, shocking. <laughs> As we go through the book, several thoughts come to our mind. Which is the better way? To speak to those in need, those developing nations, or major polluters? Is it to offer a solution? Or is it to tell them to blanket ban on fossil fuels? Things that they are not clean, but the only cheap and accessible form of energy they can rely on. As people are listening in the developed nations, sometimes they take things for granted, such as clean water piped straight to your home non-stop power supplied 24 hours a day whereas developing nations have to deal with dirty water or power outages it's easy to see a lot of problems where you don't have to worry about clean water or power i like the change in perspective that patrick moore experienced at the nairobi conference that we're all one team seeking to progress our society whilst preserving the earth therefore some form of compromise must be made we can't just demonize those who disagree with us these people who are environmental activists claim to have science on their side, but they are in fact the least scientific because they don't have the qualifications, nor do they want to listen to the experts. In such a case where the Greenpeace directors were trying to ban chlorine because it was toxic, Patrick Moore was trying to explain to them that they should not ban chlorine because it's necessary for living. Medicine is made of chlorine precisely because it's toxic to the viruses and bacteria. How can you claim to protest when we don't have the facts right? I think we're uncovering what's at the heart of a movement. It's definitely not scientific, nor is it sustainable. And now, back to the show. So, you know, he, he does go into a little bit about, you know, chlorine. Yeah. And he goes, well, table salt is sodium chloride, NaCl. So yeah. about two thirds of chlorine by weight. So it's essential for nutrients for plants, animals, including humans. And then your stomach acid is hydrochloric acid. And you need that to digest food. Uh, chlorine lives in the Earth's crust, just like carbon. And then it's also the 11th most abundant element in the Earth's crust. And then it talks about, you know, PVC is used for water pipes, sewer pipes, electrical insulation, roofings, decks, uh, walls, important for healthcare facilities, for blood bags, intravenous tubing, gloves, caps, flooring, flooring, and wall covering. So, you know, so, so if you know, if you ban chlorine, then you, well, how do you fix, um, you know, how do you, you do healthcare? Yeah. You, you need it. You don't <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Again, well in well intentioned going, hey, we want to try and we want to try and save the planet. Yeah. But in the on the journey to achieving that goal, you end up harming the harming human life that's living on the planet, and that's a direct consequence of your actions. That's a bit of a problem. Mm. I'll skip a bit because we're looking at time. Mm. So we're, we're going to cut out the forestry bit and maybe we'll leave that for another time. Yeah. Uh, but we're talking about uh, his perspectives on energy, which is sort of linking with our episode about two sessions ago about mm. nuclear power. So by 2050, many experts believe the world's larger, more fluent p population will demand 25 to 35 terawatts of commercial energy. The International Energy Agency predicts a 40% increase in demand by 2030. One reason for this is that China and India, with 40% of the world's population, are only now entering the automobile and air conditioning era in a significant way. By 
our commercial energy consumption increases rapidly. Some argue that we should simply reduce our energy usage uh, use across the board, conserving our way to a significant reduction in fossil fuel use. The problem with this approach is so many people on the planet already live in total energy poverty. One third of the world's population will live without any electricity or any other modern energy supplies. Another third has only limited access. Without electrical energy, life is difficult and often miserable. People naturally don't want to remain energy poor. Even the slightest increase in energy used by the poorest two thirds of humanity will overwhelm any conservation says we can accomplish in the developed world. This is not to suggest conservation isn't worthwhile. Whether we can economically increase energy efficiency in our vehicles, homes and appliances, we should do so. But at some point you can't diet your way out of starvation. Conservation cannot conserve what is not produced. Others suggest replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy sources such as hydroelectric, geothermal, wind, solar and biomass. What do you think? In here he's talking about how these solutions are they are a viable option. Yep. But they can't be they can't be a substitute or replacement of fossil fuel for our energy use. No. So, you know, he talks about nuclear energy in this one in this one area. You know, it's it's unique. It's radioactive, he acknowledges that, but it produces way more energy than coal. Yeah. Right? But unfortunately, people have been programmed to to be afraid of nuclear. Well, they associate more. it with nuclear bomb and radioactivity yeah. and that stuff. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Um, Hiroshima, um, Chernobyl. Chernobyl yeah. 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 So they've been programmed to be more afraid of nuclear than they are of coal. And they're already pretty afraid of coal, so yeah. yeah. And, and only if you want to switch to the renewable stuff, you have to be rich to afford that kind of stuff. So yeah, exactly. Um, so you go. Is it was it Nairobi that they and that first conference where he was first started to be awakened to this yeah. other perspective. Yeah. He if he if he took a solar or um, hydro or wind technology there and went, hey, just use this. Yeah. He would have been laughed out of the room. Yeah. Because we can't use that. It's it's not enough. Mm. It, we can't, it doesn't compete to coal. So why in the world would we use it? Yep. So, it, you know, solar panels is a, is a option for the rich. Um, and he says here, in mid-2010, the wheels began to come off the heavily subsidized solar industry in Europe. Spain has reduced the subsidy by 30% and may retro retroactively reduce the tariff it guarantee for 20 years. Spanish solar companies are being investigated for selling solar energy at night. It is presumed they were running diesel generators and sending the power through the meters that measure solar output. Right. <laughs> Such incredible distortions to market prices are bound to lead this kind of fraudulent activity. So why is this? Because you sell the electricity prices. So you, well, if you have a solar panel on your roof, right, you sell the solar energy back to the grid. Yeah. But to make it to make that feasible and to encourage people, the tariffs are so high. So the rate at what you what you can sell at is so high. Yeah. So some people are trying to join that and say, hey, let's get some money by saying burning diesel generators yeah. to, to pretend that solar energy and yeah. send it back. Uh, Sneaky. Yeah. But I do want to get to this main point, which is what this uh, podcast is episodes about so mm -hmm. he talks about the underlying motives and beliefs so greenpeace is about green the earth peace with humanity yeah. so there's a co, the co existing existence. yeah yeah but then what happens he observes it's just now green there is no peace mm. so i'll read out from this bit here there is an unfortunate tendency among environmental activists to characterize the human species as a negative influence on the earth we are likened to a malignant cancer that is spreading threatening to destroy biodiversity, upsetting the balance of nature, causing the collapse of the global ecosystem. The great myth of the movement is that humans are not really part of nature, that we are somehow unnatural and apart from the pure natural world. For some reason, this idea, like original sin, appeals to people who feel guilty about existence. We are not worthy, they think. Mm. So I like that bit, original sin. Yeah. That it's, 
environmentalism becomes like a, a, religion, a religion a religion unto itself yeah. because there's a there's a there's a problem mm -hmm. right and they're saying people are a problem yeah. and that uh, utopia is a perfect green lush world yeah without humans because yeah. only humans cause destruction yeah animals don't and, and he's saying well no because this idea assumes humans are unnatural yeah but we're also living in this place as well yes it's, it, it is a coexistence and i think you just you, you you're right in describing it's, it's human nihilism isn't it yeah yeah so the only things that humans can do is destroy. Yeah. That's what the idea. And I don't think there's a healthy perspective on humanity. No, because it ends in a self in, in self defeat. Like what well, what is the solution to then that problem? Like <laughs> no humans? Really? Yeah. Social suicide, humanity. Pre pretty pretty much. It's it it is. It is it is death of the entire species. Oh, human, human extinction. Human extinction. Yeah, yeah. Hu that's what I'm after. Human exti mm. extinction on the altar of Mother Earth. Yeah. Yeah. And you go, hang on, but that doesn't make any sense. So like I thought the point was for us to live in harmony with the no humans. Okay, cool. Yeah. But yeah, that, I think that's some of the ideas that, you know, my friends who are very, you know, very green and who cares about environment yeah they would also see that you know you know humans are a disease on this planet and it's just so negative yeah well what what does that do to your well what does it do to your, to your mental health to you, the way you see yourself your the way you see your the, the worth of or your value if you're seeing yourself as a virus as a plague as something that needs to be destroyed for the betterment of the planet like though it's those sort of thinking that sort of mindset you get into you go where what sort of what where where do you go from there like what kind of hope can you derive from that what we come to i guess is some of the language and nuances that uh patrick moore actually clarifies and i think this is a better way to approach sort of sustainable development and this is some of the definitions he come up with so Sustainable development requires that we obtain the food, energy, and materials necessary for our civilization, and perhaps even increase the resources in developing countries, while at the same time working to reduce our negative impacts on the environment through changes in our behavior, practices, and changes in our technologies. So many activists will read this and say something like, no way, man, the more people there are and the more resources they use, the more damage they will do to the environment. It is commonly believed that our ecological footprint can be measured directly from summing up the amount of resources we consume. This is one of the more dangerous myths in modern environmental thinking. It is dangerous because it leads people, young people in particular, to give up any hope of saving the environment from an eventual collapse due to overpopulation mm -hmm. and overconsumption. I recently spoke to a grade 11 class at an inner city school in the Bronx. During question period, a young woman asked matter of factly, how many years will it be until the earth is dead? She took it for granted that climate change would soon kill us all. This is the saddest thing about the extent to which apocalyptic predictions has taken root in the media, political forums, and among the general public. More young people feel utterly bleak about their future. So, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of assumptions here that says the earth will die. And yeah. it's like... Well, how does it die? I'm trying to think. How will it die? Like, is it desert or is it ice or is it like flooding? You know, like you know, water Sup world, supernova. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen? I think it's the Nick Cage movie, The Knowing. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Well, no. It's sol solar flare. <laughs> That's okay. how we go. All right. <laughs> yep. So, all right. So, the first bit is renewable. Renewable is used to describe resources, energy supplies that have relatively short cycles of natural replenishment. Nearly all renewable resources are based on the sun's energy. This includes biomass, hydroelectric energy, geothermal heat pumps, wind and solar energy, and the wood used for fuel, construction, and paper products. Trees and the wood to produce are the most abundant renewable material and energy resource. Our own agricultural food crops, as well as, well as wild fish, game, and plants are renewable and based on solar energy. The term clean, as in clean technology, is relatively new and simply refers to technology that does not pollute the environment. 
By this standard, wind, solar, nuclear, and hydroelectric energy are all clean. But it's important to look at the full life cycle. All technologies have impacts on the environment. Bauxite ore must be mined to make aluminum for solar panels. Cement must be produced for hydroelectric dams. And nuclear plants and factories must be built to produce liquid biofuels. So clean is a relative term meaning cleaner. Much cleaner, we hope, than previous or alternative technologies. There's something interesting in that quote. We hope. Mm. We don't know. How do you measure? And it, because you can't just say, look, the solar panels aren't, you know, smoking or anything like that or yeah. giving off radiation. But in, we talked last time, it takes materials to develop that solar panel. Yes. So that's the full life cycle that he's talking about. Well, we, there's a term of your carbon footprint. Yeah. What is your carbon footprint for producing said solar panel as opposed to producing coal factory? Yeah. You weigh those up and you also you weigh up the potential for those end products to produce energy. Mm. Like end of the day, both of those uh, producers of energy use energy themselves to come into existence in the first place. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're using, we're using energy, we're using resources regardless that require fossil fuel. Mm. How do they, how, do, how, what do we do? Yeah. And then there's a little bit here that says, you know, just because something's renewable doesn't mean it's clean. So he refers to wood, you know, if you burn wood, you get soot, you get fire and people die. Uh, 1.5 million people die annually, according to who due to indoor smoke from uh, cooking and heating. So there's, I think there's sort of a trade-off here, there. So I'll go to the third point. So the third point is sustainability. So st sustainability is a relative concept depending on the time scale we consider. On one hand, nothing is infinitely sustainable. Even the sun will burn out, evidently take the earth with it. Billions of years from now, for practical purposes, it makes sense to define sustainable in terms of human generations means getting away from just thinking about tomorrow or a few years from now and thinking 100, 200, and even 500 years in the future. Just because a resource is renewable doesn't mean it is sustainable. So he refers to about, you know, buffalo herds, which have become sustainable, but then if we're, they're over harv harvesting, they become extinct. And then also sustainability is not only an environmental concept, but also includes economic and social factors. Solar panels use solar radiation, which in itself is highly sustainable, but at a cost of more than 50 cents per kilowatt hour, 10 or more times the co cost of conventional electricity sources, it is unlikely solar panels are economically sustainable, especially in developing countries. It is more important for a resource to, be, to come to be sustainable than it is to be renewable. And even renewable resources require non-renewable resources to operate. So solar panels use aluminum, silicon, and gallium arsenide. Wind turbines require a lot of steel and concrete for the towers, about as five times as much per unit of energy produced compared to a nuclear power plant. So, so that's talking about the resources used to construct wind turbine compared yeah. to a nuclear power plant. And lastly, so green. So green, now we come to green, the most elusive and pr least precise of the four terms. Green is the most political term as it tends to reflect personal biases and opinions as much as objective and measurable criteria. At its worst, green is a shameless marketing slogan used to promote various products and services as environmentally friendly. Yet it is a useful term, a way of distinguishing relatively damaging technologies from one we have that has less impact. If it is used objectively, but green is very much in the eye of the beholder. We have green jobs, green energy, green buildings, green peace, and green spirit. Green includes renewable, sustainable, and clean. Greens believe in green attributes, but disagree widely on what should be included in the category. So many greens oppose hydroelectric energy, even though it is the largest source of renewable electricity. Many greens oppose nuclear energy, even though it's sustainable and clean. Yeah, so then this, he goes on, but... The idea is that you can measure clean, right? Yeah. You can measure sustainable in generations. You can measure renewable by it's how it's done. Yeah. But what is green and becomes, well, how do you define green? It's, yeah. it's just so hard. It's indefinable in some ways. Yeah. Because it includes sort of all three. And then yeah. one person has an idea of green 
and the other person has a different idea of green. And then yeah. they all sort of grind against each other because, you know, greens, you know, we say we want renewable energy. How about hydroelectric power? Well, no, because of, you know, damage the environment yeah. or flood some things. Um, and I was actually recently at Cairns and then there, there's this um, old hydroelectric dams built in the 1930s. Yeah. And it's feeding power all the way down to Melbourne. Mm. Yeah, that is a, a good thing because we saw stuff like crocodiles. Um, what's that animal called? I'm trying to remember. Uh, cassowary. Oh, yeah. Yep. So those things are almost look like dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. And then there was also fauna, which was there for about, you know, billions of years before even humanity was there. There's like, you know, dinosaur era plants. You know, you're not destroy environment you're just changing it and then other wildlife lives in it right and, and so you know you got to be very careful of green uh, there's another important point i think and it's also about consensus uh, we, we we talked about this earlier but i think i want to bring it out which is you you, you if you want to move forward you want to generate some kind of consensus you can't just you need to separate the pe people from the interests so it needs a bit of stoicism and you know looking away from good versus bad black and white and yeah. saying what's the interest and how can our interests all mingle together you know eventually some things will have to compromise but you can list out what you agree and what you disagree and so rather than just you know being negative and saying you can't do this you can't do that list ways you want to move forward and the solutions that you can work on together so I'll, I'll end up with my final thoughts after reading this book and um, and then I'll, I'll let you uh, go on with what you, you thought some of the yeah. stuff that we discussed. Um, I like this book, you know, buy the book. Uh, we haven't talked all about all his adventures about saving whales, baby seals and some of the stuff he's talked about like um, GMO, uh, highly efficient farming, you know, salmon farming. Um, it links in some of the stuff that we talked about uh, with... I guess Michael Schellenberger, who's an environmentalist, who want to reduce. If you want to save the planet, we've got to reduce our footprint, which is you got to use technology. You got to embrace it because it's our only way of innovating. Yeah. And to bring us, you know, bring those developing countries to developed countries, so they can actually reduce all those, you know, fossil fuel usage. Yeah. So we only talked about the, the stuff about energy, um, and I think it also links with the stuff about nuclear. And I like the bit about the there's a philosophy and religiosity if that's a word yeah. of, of environmentalism which is you know humans are a cancer on the world that kind of stuff and no one's denying climate change so you, you can't just you say we're climate deniers the, the weather always changes right yeah but you know can you attribute it to human development and then if so how much yeah is it a bad thing or is it a good thing so since when did it become a bad thing to ask questions? Yeah. And that, cause really that's all we're doing. We're, uh, we are asking questions and we'd like, and we'd like answers. That's it. Yeah. So since when did that become taboo mm. or a evil in society to question things? Yeah. But I'll, I'll give you an example, which um, I think I picked up when I was listening to him talk and it was mm. like, you know, if the world will go um, four degrees, high or whatever yeah. right which it's pretty extreme right yeah but it's like you know we live in australia you know four degrees whereabouts you yeah. know um you talk about north northern territory mm. you know that can be quite hot but then you know for tasmania and those colder areas yeah you know, they could deal with a bit of four <laughs> degrees in, in the the issue, the issue of course with that though is that if Tasmania went four degrees hotter, yeah, their entire climate, their entire ecosystem would shift and change. It would shift and change, but it's not this you know, twenty twelve movie or oh, the day after tomorrow and oh, everything of course just not. dies of course out. Not. No, of course not. But that again, remember that's Hollywood. Mm. So, Hollywood made a roaring trade. I think it was in the early two thousands of disaster of of global earth disaster movies of some force of oh, the planet just ripping ripping itself apart to try and destroy and kill every single human it could find mm. um yeah yeah i'll do also want to finish up with one bit there mm. is that you know 
there's a bit about consensus, you know. Yeah. The science is, you know, is settled, you know. We've got a whole bunch of people saying that the there is a climate change, there's a climate crisis. Yeah. But science has never been about consensus. It's always been fact. Fact-driven, yeah. And, Evidence. And, and then they sort of link it, you know, with flat earth deniers and the kind of stuff, flat earthers yeah. and that kind of stuff. If you deny climate change, you're a flat earther. Yeah. But, you know, if you think back to like Copernicus and Galileo, yeah, they were the on the minority yeah. and the whole society at the, time? the Catholic church was yeah. the majority in it. And they were the consensus That's that right. the earth was flat. Yeah, exactly. So how can you use that example? That's it's such it, a bad one. Well, this links into, this links a little bit into what I, what my final thoughts are here. It's that, but first the, I think there's a, there's a, there's a problem at the heart of the environmental movement right now. And I think it's been tapped on in this book where it's become a religion. It's become, and it's, it's cast, it's presented itself as providing hope and salvation, the solution, especially for young people. And, and young people, we, we've spoken about this on this podcast, that people our age, we're looking for the mission. We're looking for something to, to fight for. We're looking for purpose and meaning. And Greenpeace is happily sitting here or sitting sitting over there presenting hey we have your mission we have your uh what would you call it i guess we, we're giving you a new meaning and a purpose yeah, that's because a, yeah, if that's you don't do it here's the apocalypse exactly exactly do do what we say or else doom and devastation yeah like i am so afraid of this kind of stuff so. yeah exactly and i think that there are a lot of groups and organizations that are marketing on and taking advantage of fear and yeah. despair and hopelessness. And they, they, they've created a trade. I think it is a trade of control, power, exercising that influence over people, especially young people who are mm. desperately looking around for purpose and meaning and something to fight for. Yeah. And it's an easy trap. I think it's an easy trap to fall into because it leaves you open to manipulation for re what we've tapped into today. We've, we've run these, some of the ideas that Greenish Peace have been spooking for a couple of decades now is a really uh, at the heart, heart of it trading in your own extinction your own your own destruction human nihilism that's yeah. not and you are someone you know, that's not good i want to still live i still want to exist well I'm, do you I'm a part of nature <laughs> yeah exactly it's like but if you go if you ask them hey do you think greenpeace is a good organization they're doing good things yeah i think i think they're doing some good stuff yeah yeah they what they're advocating for is for your destruction and then where's the science? Because, you know, yeah. Patrick Moore was saying he's the only one with an ecology degree. Well, yeah, exactly. When he left it. Exactly. He, as an expert. And again, trust the experts. Listen to the experts. Well, <laughs> sorry. Uh, here's an expert right here going, hey, guys, you can't just go ban chlorine. Apparently you could. <laughs> Apparently you could. But yeah. I think I think it's, I think it's he tapped into something really, really interesting where... And I think it's really relevant to, especially today, especially to this climate that we've found ourselves in, we've lost the ability to compromise, yeah, to reach some sort of middle ground, especially with people who disagree with us, mm -hmm. who don't see eye to eye on every single issue. Yeah. We've lost the ability to go, hey, it's okay that we disagree. Let's try to find some middle ground where we can coexist together and not try to rip each other's throats out. Yeah. That's something that we, I think we desperately need to try and figure out how to have these sort of conversations that don't devolve into a shouting match going, you're an ex or you're an, you are a fascist. No, you're a communist. You're a socialist. Yeah. And you're right. You're left. Yeah. Red, blue, whatever. But yeah, I think it's um, taken up for a step when he went to that Nairobi conference and not seeing yeah. things as good versus bad, but like. You know, I can see your, your point. You're yeah. a developing country. You can't just eliminate all fossil fuel usage. Yeah. You got to develop, otherwise you die. Yeah. You, you need, I think the first step is listening. Yeah. Is take a little bit of the Socratic method and assume that you know, go into a conversation or go into examining an argument, assume you know nothing. Assume you're complete, a blank slate, completely ignorant and listen and evaluate the argument, the case that's being presented, we use critical think. We can use critical critical thinking skills that we have mm -hmm. to try and work out which which idea is actually good and which idea is bad. 
Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a good idea. Mm. Um, any last words? No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Uh, that, that was my closing point. No, okay. so. right, I'll, I'll cut her off as there. And we'll... Thanks for listening to another episode of The Fire in the Desert. We hope you learned a lot from today's episode as we review and discuss some of the key points from Patrick Moore's book on Confessions from a Greenpeace Dropout. I liked how his journey towards leaving Greenpeace revealed some of the unhealthy thoughts of the people within Greenpeace, that there is a cynical mindset that humans are a cancer on the planet, that people refuse to compromise when trying to argue whether to stop using things that appear to be unhealthy, such as chlorine, People are looking at things through a black and white lens and can only see themselves as the good guys, whilst those who disagree are portrayed as the bad. It is very hard to get together and move forward if we don't separate the person with their interests. If you like this episode, please like, share and subscribe to us, forward the episode to your friends to help us get more listeners and to discuss these ideas. It helps motivate me to make more episodes for you guys. You can reach us at thefireinadesert at gmail.com or Twitter at fireinadesert. Music is Outfoxing the Fox by Kevin McLeod at incontech.com. And thank you for listening, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye.